The massive growth spurt in cloud computing continued in 2022, and it doesn't appear to be slowing down now that we're well, well into 2023. We can credit the cloud for enabling quick, important moves as everyone adjusted to each new normal. And as we've now completed the rapid adoption phase, characterized by a shoot first and aim later style that was undoubtedly necessitated by an endless series of unprecedented conditions and unforeseen circumstances, it's now time to return to the more pragmatic aim then shoot. And this pragmatism raises a few important questions. Did we miss anything? Is this sustainable, secure, and scalable? Where is the alignment between business and IT? Do we have the right cloud skills on our team? How do we understand or even manage these costs? How is success measured? And my favorite, what now? Well, the questions as well as some structure for answers can be found in the WWT Research Report Cloud Priorities for 2023. Now you'll find that there are only four deceptively simple priorities put forth, cloud optimization, cloud security, cloud skills, and cloud edge. But as always, the good stuff is found within the details. And for this reason, we are doing a couple of cloud priority deep dives. Today, we dive into cloud edge. You see, if cloud computing is the act of running workloads within clouds, why have so many user complaints been left on premises? Buffering an application, slowness, and even timeouts. Negative outcomes that may or may not be related to connectivity, but are more likely explained by the distance our data must travel to reach those end users. The increased use of AI and ML-powered applications does necessitate the relocation of compute power closer to the point of use, aka the edge. No, edge computing, the act of running workloads on edge devices. Now there is a lot of innovation in this area and it's worth looking a bit deeper so you can decide for yourself because there's so much data and so little time. My name is Rob Boyd. You're watching Tech 37, your home for technology, education, and collaboration from Worldwide Technology. Well, hey guys, welcome to Tech 37. So glad you could take the time to join us. Um, Let's get some introductions out of the way first. Uh, I'll start with you, Jennifer. Do you mind telling us who you are, what you do for Worldwide? Sure, thanks, Rob. It's great to be here and to be a part of this Tech 37 podcast. My name is Jennifer Adafala, and I'm a strategic solutions consultant at Worldwide Technology. My team helps support our business development and go-to-market initiatives for edge, cloud, and mobility solutions. And coming this June, I've actually been at Worldwide now for 19 years. 19 years. Wow, that's incredible. Okay, Jennifer, Kurt, what do you do? Have you been around as long as, as Jennifer? Uh, not quite as long, um, <laughs> but I am actually a distinguished solutions architect with inside of our global service provider division. And I've been with WWT for nine years. And at, for the last few years, my focus has been primarily on edge computing strategies for uh, telco space. Okay, excellent. Well, I, it, that's not shabby. And um, and, but you've both been in the industry for a while. This is what you focus on, and this is why you're on this particular uh, edition of the podcast as we kind of deep dive in a couple of different areas around the cloud priorities report that Worldwide Technology released for 2023, this one specifically on cloud edge. And I want to make sure, because I think this is always important at the top, and Jennifer, I wonder if you mind breaking this down for us in terms of, well, what is cloud edge? Why is it considered a priority? What's the market like? So for me, um, in order to better understand what computing is, I think it's helpful to understand what edge computing is not. And edge computing is not a transport, and I'll explain what that is in just a minute. Um, it's not a business application and it's not cloud computing. So starting with the transport side, um, we all know what Wi-Fi is, right? Um, there's a lot of buzzwords out there like 5G, private LTE, and you can even go back in the 1990s when dial-up was around to connect to the internet. So just to simplify things, these are connectivities or transports. When you think of um, like a bridge, for example, and you're on a bike or a car or a speed train, um, to get from one side to the other. So essentially there's different types of transports, mm -hmm. but the data is basically, a, it's a, a bridge to get the data to and from where it needs to go. And while edge computing needs one of these transports to move the data back and forth, edge computing is not a transport. Um, there's also buzzwords out there like artificial intelligence, machine learning, computer vision, digital twins, I could go on and on. 
Um, these are all applications. And you could say there are the business use cases that we're trying to solve for um, from an edge computing standpoint. It's the application that the end user is interacting with. And while tied to edge computing, again, it's not edge computing. These applications can leverage the speed and latency that um, edge computing can provide, um, but edge computing is not an application. So this leads into actual cloud computing. When you think of computing, you need to think of like the brains, the processing to make the decisions when the data is presented. So with cloud computing, industries have been rethinking how they do businesses for years, um, continually adopting new processes and technologies to help improve the employee and customer experiences and more recently to unlock those new revenue streams through the, the digital transformation. A retail um, industry is a great example. So they're leveraging mobile apps, kiosk, digital signage. Um, the Another example, Industry 4.0 has been shifting the manufacturing industry um, to be data focused and allow the artificial intelligence and machine learning to drive actual decisions. Healthcare has started monitoring uh, patients remotely, leveraging video chats. So all of this um, leads into a key point. Cloud companies has been the forefront of digital transformation, but due to massive amounts of data, so I mean massive, massive amounts of data going back and forth and the number of devices that, that are out there, a problem has come up with just leveraging the cloud. Users have started seeing buffering, slowness, maybe the apps crashing or, or timing out. So this is, this is because the data is having to travel so far back and forth, so across that bridge, back and forth, um, long distances, and maybe that buffering is, is fine for certain situations, but when you start to look at situations where real-time data is needed, or if it's a um, life and death type situation, then there's a need for edge solutions or more likely these hybrid cloud edge solutions that we're talking about here. Question on that, just as a clarification, and then Kurt, I'll get you to weigh in on this too, but is it correct to say that in my estimation, maybe organizations over-rotated in terms of what cloud could do for them, maybe didn't always, or maybe they just uh, evolved into this, but didn't realize the impact. You know, your data center normally is in a location you control, you control everything is under your, your umbrella, you move it somewhere else, now it's some indeterminate distance away from the user that's needing the processing to happen. And you're saying that distance in certain applications is causing some real issues to where cloud is still a good answer, but maybe cloud's not being used in the manner in which it could really excel. And that's why you may not be getting the benefits you're looking for because of that distance. Is that a, a fair or correct reason? Yeah. At all? Um, yeah. So I, I guess from, from that standpoint, um, cloud computing is absolutely a great, um, great solution today. And from your, your topic of over rotating, in the past, we didn't have these speeds that we have today. We didn't have, you know, the new technology of 5G coming, et cetera. So in the past, it was working really well, and it, it still works really well today. It's just it's coming up with um, all these new technologies and, and everything that is causing this issue uh, overall. Yeah. Kurt, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. Well, I, I really think it's... um. You know, we're looking at a distributed model here, right? You know, instead of trying to pump all of our data and our information into, you know, one central location, cloud computing really brought, brought around the capabilities here that now we have availability zones, right? And with those availability zones, we have a way to, you know, offload some of those resources into the public cloud space where, you know, a private organization may not have the resources in that particular location to build a function with inside of their service or application requirements. And, you know, one of the uh, actually team members just last week at WWT had brought up a, a very simplistic understanding of edge computing, which is basically if it's not in the data center, it's at the edge. And this really comes from um, an edge computing terminology that's been evolving for the last several years, depending on which OEM, you know, that you're talking to um, or which uh, independent software vendor. And, you know, they call it anything from, you know, where does the near edge exist to the far edge? And then, of course, there's telco edge as well as cloud edge. Right. And really it is about, you know, how close to the devices it needs to be. And we take a look at, you know, those business use cases and, and figure out how that's going to operate effectively. 
And sometimes that's, you know, running everything with inside of the cloud edge model and doing that with inside of those public clouds um, or, you know, getting it closer to the device to make it successful for the, you know, the business outcome that that company is looking for. Interesting. OK, I think this sounds like something worthy to check out to say, well, you may just have an implementation that deserves a, a bit more tweaking and thus the awareness needed to understand where edge solutions might provide simple answers of not necessarily re-architecting everything or starting over from scratch or just saying cloud's not for us, uh, th this yeah. could offer some for you. Well, we've seen video streaming companies out there, you know, that leverage public cloud solutions as well, you know, that have same similar buffering issues when very popular shows, you know, come out on, on a weekend, for example, and, you know, they have to um, have people queued in order to receive that content and you know edge computing is is certainly one method of getting it closer by a more distributed model right you know so instead of having something just in la or new york or something it's more like you know now we're going to do this in the west side of la and the central side right you know so we have ability here with inside of edge computing to provide more resource availability and of course, looking at streaming, it's really about content delivery, right? So how do we do low latency, high bandwidth type of scenarios with inside of streaming technology? And that starts with being able to cache that content closer to the end device that's trying to uh, stream with it, whether that's across a 5G network on a mobile device or somebody's laptop or TV in their home, right? It's all going to be something similar that they need to be able to connect into the closest edge you know, system possible to get the best experience. Well, and I like, uh, Jennifer, you started to cover some use cases, and I think just kind of understanding what is the, the ripest fruit in the market right now for uh, customers that are saying this is providing real answers for us. I wonder if you could cite some, um, uh, some use case examples that customers are focused on. Absolutely. Um, so, so Kurt and I uh, have, have actually gone across our company and talked to lots of different industries, and the, the two areas that customers seem to be most excited about today are computer vision and uh, the private wireless networks uh, mm -hmm. aspects. And, and they're just being what's talked about the most and something that, and I guess a lot of times edge computing, you think of things that are maybe futuristic or you know years out from now, but computer vision is something that is being purchased today. If you think about it, cameras are literally everywhere they're in stores, they're at stoplights, they're even in cars now. So um, if you add the enhancements of computer vision software to those cameras, so think of it, turning it into a smart camera um, so that it can start to detect things. Maybe there's you know water on the floor and you need to alert someone to go clean up the water so no one, so that someone doesn't slip and fall on the floor or there's a box coming in and there's a serial number that it can scan to tell you what are the components inside of the box in the location. Um, so not only is computer vision solving those operational issues, but also proving to be strong return on investment to justify those, um, the business case overall. We actually have some, some real case studies that we have done um, recently with computer vision specifically. And one example is with a uh, restaurant buffet business. They have thousands of locations um, around the United States and they were wanting to minimize, um, minimize the food waste on the buffet line, but also um, keep the customers happy with their favorite dishes and having them prepared at all times. They had tried other solutions in the past with um, heat and weight sensors, but you can imagine the food spillage and things like that. It, it just wasn't a great um, solution overall. So by adding cameras over the buffet lines um, to, to watch the food, I, along with that computer vision modeling, they were able to get the visibility to report and track and alert and actually send a notification to the chefs to get the food out there on time with a 95% accuracy um, in food measurement. Yeah. That's, that's, and, the thing I want to point out there, just to make sure I'm understanding it correctly, but so computer vision is using cameras as a sensor less about like we might think of a camera and then I'm going to view that camera and humans viewing it. This is about computers using the camera as a source of data that can be analyzed, crunched decisions made as it's fed back over based on what it dissected. You're saying in this case, the camera's not looking at the people serving a buffet or the uh, or either side of it. It's looking at the food and it's saying, this is what full looks like. This is what half full. This is what empty need help. 
looks like perhaps just to oversimplify. I'm sure it's more than that, but, and then it's, but it's translating that into something that becomes useful for executing and keeping that condition from happening. Yep. Yeah. That's, and and, and absolutely. And, and the cameras themselves too. I mean, it's not just about, you know, using computer vision on a camera. It's also has abilities to look at the different types of sensors that are out there on the market too. So thinking of the, the heat sensors and the door sensors and, and create an integrated solution for AI analytics to be able to process that information. Um, in addition to that, I mean, we think about a camera that's looking at that buffet line while you have another camera that's looking at the patrons coming in the door, right? And in those cases, they can determine, you know, when the heavy traffic is, is coming in, looking for particular food items, and to be able to make sure that they actually pre-order food before they even show up so it's hot and ready. So there's certainly a lot of capabilities there. And just the same way as we look at, you know, manufacturing, um, you know, use cases with, with inside of computer vision as well. And, you know, we have those factory line floors that are actually going through and processing, you know, new equipment, for example, if we're talking like an air compressor going down a factory line and being assembled. Well, if you get one wire out of place, you've got a faulty, you know, air compressor getting boxed up and shipped out. Where in this case, you know, we can actually use those same type of cameras to keep an eye on those particular items going across the factory line floor, but then also use other cameras to monitor the equipment making the factory item too. So that way you've got less downtime because you can analyze risk and build the setup maintenance schedules and everything in order to repair your factory line, you know, instead of having a, a big revenue loss because of it being down. The technology inside, the technology that moves the world. Intel. Now, the, the reason why this is a cloud edge focus, because I've heard there's similar work, uh, stories around, of course, using Bluetooth low energy, infrared for footfall traffic and some different things like this that all come with their ver various sets of complexities, perhaps. This sounds like a very intelligent thing that requires uh, probably some analytics, some AI uh, and or machine learning, just throwing those terms out because I think uh, something mm -hmm. goes up when I do that. Um, and, um, but, and that processing has to happen somewhere. And the idea is the retail location is not gonna have a data center on site that's gonna do that. So they are looking to say, how do we do that processing? It's not conceivable to to cart that data across the country just to come back and say that bucket needs refilling or that hot pan, but it's saying it happens, it needs to be a kind of a real time analysis so you can immediately act to it. And that's why that, that processing has to happen as close to the restaurant uh, in question as possible, right? Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And it's going to the inferencing server, as they call it, you know, is basically going to be determined on its location on that actual latency and bandwidth requirements that exist there, right? You know, because as you can imagine, if we think about those single edge site locations, like the retail store, um, they probably just have a closet space, you know, available to be able to take and put an edge appliance in. And so oftentimes the inferencing happens back at the cloud edge, while the immediate tasks that, you know, require the camera setup and connectivity and everything in the application workload is happening inside that retail storefront. So there are, you know, options that determine that, but, um, and it also depends on, on the risk for the company, right? When we think about how quickly does that, you know, AI need to actually respond in this case, um, you know, if a factory line, you know, for example, needs to have an immediate response to stop the factory floor as an action item from the camera detection, then that could be something that's real time. If, if it's more tracking, you know, security detection, those sorts of things, or it can be slight delays. It's really going to be dependent on a customer by customer basis. Well, that, that is a great point. And, and actually, I know you have some other examples around the computer vision. I wonder if I could ask you, though, real quick, because I don't think we'll need to stay on this one. But you'd mentioned, Jennifer, uh, private wireless which to me is a connectivity method. Um, and we know this is not connectivity. Where is private wireless become important uh, for edge, uh, edge computing? Yeah, so it ties back to kind of the, the first description where edge computing needs some sort of transport. Um, so I guess it, it's coupling the, the three together um, meaning the application, the computing, and the, uh, adding the private LTE or private 5G as a use case on top of edge computing. 
Um, we have some solutions that we are actually leveraging within one of our warehouses close to our global headquarters um, where uh, th there was a challenge. Every time you moved a printer, you'd have to go out there and re drop a cable and rewire it. Um, so imagine thousands of dollars to have someone come out there and do that again, where with this solution, it can um, eliminate those extra costs with it becoming um, no longer needing the, the wire connectivity yeah. from that same point. Well, I was going to take a stab at my understanding of why this becomes important. And Kurt, you may want to weigh in and correct me here um, if this is something you're comfortable with. But so we covered private wireless and some other things on, a, on the wireless priorities um, uh, as part of the series that we're doing, uh, kind of deep diving into some of these different research reports. And as I loosely understand it, one of the benefits, a lot of people don't know that private wireless, such as LTE, um, running on CBRS band, something like this is now available to where you have, I don't think a lot of people realize that Wi-Fi is not the most controllable uh, connectivity that's easy to work with. And there are certain um, technologies like you guys apparently deal with quite a bit that need a very predictable rate of timing that you can rely on. And because of the fact that it's controlled centrally uh, in the core, there's a, core, a controller in the core for a private wireless type of thing, you've got a lot more things to play with to really guarantee that your machines are able to communicate or your devices or whatever it may be that you're trying to solve in a very consistent manner, especially in an area that may not even make sense for Wi-Fi or have other technologies available to it. Is I'm sure there's more to it, but I don't know. Kurt, you have anything to add to that? Well, I mean, I guess the, the biggest thing is, is that we have a mobility practice with inside of our you know global service provider team that specializes in all things related to our private wireless networks and, and mobile network solutions. And, you know, it is something, as, as Jenny mentioned earlier, is, is that, you know, we're intertwined here when it comes to the technology around the edge space, because depending on the edge application itself may require 5G devices to make things function. Um, or it could be just Wi-Fi enabled devices, right? You know, to your point earlier, which is around the latency requirements of it. You know, standard network connectivity, you know, as we look towards Wi-Fi solutions, right? Wi-Fi gets upgraded to Wi-Fi 6, you know, and beyond. I mean, you know, it's all going to be determined based on the workload that's underneath it, right? And so in, in a lot of cases, you know, we go look at these devices and we think about this and we think about the uplift to take an edge site location from, you know, older network systems. I mean, because there's still 10 and 100 meg networks sitting out there. Right. And, you know, we go look at what it's going to take to get them into newer technology to support what they're looking for, whether it's computer vision or some other you know edge service that they're trying to operate. And, you know, a lot of times it's an easier solution to turn around and introduce an edge appliance out at that location and then be able to provide 5G core functionality, you know, right with inside of there so they can have the private wireless in addition to the application workload. So, you know, that's how we kind of take that approach. But certainly, you know, our mobility practices is our key experts in, you know, all things 5G and, and would be happy to, you know, have anybody want to talk to them. No, it's a nice nod because I know you guys have to partner in the background a lot of different things as, as the use cases will shift and require different components. And that's the beautiful thing about worldwide is that you've got a lot of different expertise available at a moment's notice uh, to weigh in on that. I'm curious, I don't remember if you guys called this out in your introduction. I believe you guys, I know you you run the gamut, but you tend you do spend a lot of time with service providers and the way a service provider customer may be viewing what we're speaking about here could be different than an enterprise customer. It, it may or may not be something that's important to distinguish, but I don't, Jennifer, can you comment on kind of the differences between these customers and what's if there's anything important to understand from the vantage point of one looking at uh, getting this for themselves through the other? Yeah, um, so when we're saying service provider, we're, we're speaking specifically to the big telcos and cable companies that are out there today. And regarding like their own retail stores, their internal operations, edge computing, any challenges, um, any challenges or adoption that they may have, it's very similar to that of the enterprise and public sector space today. It's different when it comes to selling edge computing to their end customers. Most of the bigger telcos and cable companies, um, so they've announced that they're partnering with the hyperscalers today, but they have the opportunity to begin to drive additional revenue streams by providing edge computing um, and those applications to their end customers as well. So if you think about it, I mean, I guess the, the telcos and cable companies have already started um, capturing other areas of new revenue streams, um, but you think of them primarily focused around the networking. So that would be 
the, the, the transport piece again. Yeah. So this would be expanding it to um, offer additional services that are, are tied to the solution. And so that's a combination uh, solution that they're, they're kind of creating solutions or working with uh, the hyperscalers would be the web, the Amazons, the um, uh, you know, your S3, your uh, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, yada, yada, right? Uh, so those, they combine together because the transport is going to play um, play a part in that. It's not part, it's not, you know, part of your definition, but I understand, yeah, that does make sense. Kurt, uh, do you have any anything else on that in terms of understanding that we need to make there? Yeah, I think I mean, to Jennifer's point is the fact that the, the telco relationship in the hyperscaler um, place is the fact that, you know, the telcos themselves are providing an availability zone for, you know, the public cloud providers, right? So a edge service, you know, that's um, being operational with inside of here for to host these applications and services. And then, of course, at the end of that, you know, you have your enterprise customers, your public sector customers who are connecting into either the telco side and connected to the hyperscaler approach through that method or direct to the hyperscaler themselves, right? And then, then of course, there's the the private edge, you know, um, which we talked about earlier, which is also what we would call the far edge, so to speak, where you have to have things more on premise, right? And in those cases, we think about, you know, security measures that are going to, you know, drive some of those pieces or just availability, cost, et cetera, you know, whatever it might be based on, you know, the specific business use case is something that we help determine in those cases. And so even though this solution is something that originated through telcos and service providers, um, it is something that you know has expanded to enterprise customers and public sector customers are looking for edge solutions because they have multiple facilities all over the place, right? right. The retail store you know, use case that we talked about earlier, we think about a thousand storefronts, right? I mean, if each and every single one of those thousand storefronts had to connect into a hyperscaler to operate you know, that computer vision technology, and they've only got a single you know, T1 line running into each of those uh, locations, it's going to be very limited, right? You know, as opposed to having something of an edge appliance there on premise to be able to satisfy everything that they need for their applications. Well, I'd like to dive in a little bit about what you guys do to help customers not only realize what they, you know, analyze their own situation to figure out if uh, this is indeed a direction they should go in and, and then how do they go about doing it and do it intelligently. Uh, Jennifer, I've been holding off as far as I, as long as I could. There's a box behind you, I believe, that is part of a solution you don't have to say it immediately, but how does that fit? What what kind of things has worldwide been doing to make this um, kind of reduce the complexity, if you will, for customers who are saying, is this a solution we need to chase after? Yeah. Um, so before I jump into the, the, the box behind me, um, really, I, I'd say systems integrators like WWT have been simplifying edge computing by providing complete end-to-end -end services to be able to advise, procure, integrate, and deploy um, edge hardware and software solutions. So whether whether you um, leverage one of the big consulting companies or a systems integrator like WWT, it all begins with, with that. It's a consultative approach to help identify the essence of the customer's use case, uh, many times starting with the challenges or what is keeping them, what is keeping them up at night, right? Building that use case uh, to define the return on investment and create that strong business case. After, um, after understanding the use cases, organizations can leverage already built um, solutions, tested systems that are out there. So think of um, multiple vendors coming together the, that are the part of the transport, the application and the computing aspects overall. And they need the systems integrators to pull everything together, that neutral party to create these fully validated edge builds, our cloud edge systems, you can say, to be demoed and then ready for the production deployments. Um, by leveraging those solution builds uh, to support the edge use cases, then, then you can see how customers can accelerate their edge strategy. What does that do? That removes the research and development, the design, the pre-sales, um, systems integrators are also taking a further from a, an end-to-end -end approach um, once it's production ready, right? So you have rapid assembly testing implementation that goes through um, global supply chain operations as well as leveraging professional services to complete that end-to-end -end solution. Um, so this box behind me specifically, um, the, the concept there is, is you can write about it, present on, on it, or even show a video, but there's nothing more valuable than experiencing those outcomes firsthand. And these, 
these entire builds that I was, was talking about before, um, we've taken them a step further into these, these smaller mobile suit sized kits um, that includes the private wireless, the edge and the application pieces overall that you can either ship directly to the customers or leverage at conferences and events. And um, it's, it's really easy. You, you just literally plug in the box and with a few simple instructions, you can start to leverage um, edge use cases. Just to give um, a little bit more about this box specifically and give some credit, this is an Athlonet packet core and an airspan radio to enable the private wireless piece, so that transport piece. We've connected um, Enro glasses um as as well as an augmented reality application to it that's that's on your phone um and we you have the, the capability to add the hybrid cloud edge um, piece as well to have that complete um and that complete box solution and for this one specifically literally you plug in an ethernet cable you turn on the power um, and then you go in your phone and you start up the application um, from a setup standpoint. And you can see how then if you're, you're experiencing that solution, it can help accelerate the adoption of cloud edge hybrid solutions today. Yeah, because I mean, it makes it real, right? And you're saying, because what you're saying in that box, is that box both a demo and an actual product that someone might deploy, obviously with their own use case versus the one you might be showcasing? But it, it, do I understand that right? So that's an actual product. Yeah, yeah. so, so okay. it, 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 exactly. It could be a demo that um, uh, to, to showcase to yeah. or to, to showcase the experience or um, you can deploy it. So Kurt earlier was talking about like in retail stores where there's not a whole lot of, of space, you could leverage it there too. But what I, it, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I love that you, I feel like you guys are saying is you're saying, look, this isn't, these aren't big, huge things that are that are difficult to kind of grok you've got examples and the idea is if i've got a thousand locations all that have small but critical data needs these sometimes provide answers because in that box you're you're you've got your connectivity and your processing kind of accounted for there on that local basis um to kind of show well this is this is all it really takes once it's been designed for what you want to achieve of course it's not just a yeah. generic thing i'm sure you ship out to people uh and just say no it's, edge, it's go for it <laughs> yeah, and it can be completely customized, right? I mean, just based on the workload and the bands of what that particular customer is looking for. Um, you know, to, to to the whole clarification of that is the fact that, you know, this solution is what we call an edge in a box, right? Um, has come around for the demand of the fact that WWT has been a system integrator now for edge computing for over four years, right? So we, we've actually been in this from the, you know, the very beginning of the transition into the edge computing space and to the fact that you know we've we've created this entire you know solution around it from you know as jennifer mentioned from our rack and stack services down to even helping our customers onboard different software vendors into the edge space right um so that's what we actually leverage our advanced technology center for so we actually have full-blown edge labs deployed with inside of that environment you know um, one that we call the converge edge platform and then the edge in a box solution is that you know kind of, I guess you could say, um, smaller version of that, right? The idea was is that we had a lot of customers that look at this and they say, that's great, that's perfect for a regional data center or for a near edge type of scenario. But what about my remote sites? I've got 20,000 locations I need to have, you know, something stood up for. And I only want, you know, one particular thing. I need 5G services and I need this one business application to function and to be able to provide me the security I need and the low latency I need for that to work. And so we created this edge in a box, you know, based on that idea. And, you know, to what Jennifer mentioned is that particular kit behind her started with the Athenet Airspan combo. And now we have it as a complete server kit solution. So you actually get your server workloads and everything. And then we customize that server based on specific, you know, OEMs that that customer is looking for, um, as well as the workload demand itself. For example, uh, does that workload require SmartNIC technology or can standard Ethernet work fine for that particular workload? Do they need GPU for AI processing? Uh, you know, as she mentioned earlier with the AR, VR type of scenarios, 
those can be coming in and to play where we have to uh, pre have a GPU loaded inside of that server to ship out. So they're going to vary. And, you know, we actually what we call blueprints is how we've coined them. So we've actually provided all the validated architecture behind the, the larger stack Converge Edge platform to the edge in a box solution. And then we create OEM specific blueprints based on, you know, the business requirements that a customer is looking for. So the, the computer vision reference, just to go back to that, um, is that our edge in a box kit can actually incorporate, okay, here's your server set up, here's your 5G system, and here's a camera to go get started with, right? And then just ship that all out to them. And in that same box that could be for demonstration purposes, as well as to run a proof of concept, can easily be transitioned into a full production edge server. So it's one of those things that you could get the kit at your location, start working with it, experience it, migrate it to production, and then of course scale that from a single server on up, right? That's incredible. And Jennifer, I think you mentioned in passing, I wanna make sure it, it doesn't go without saying, because you've got the ATC, so you've got the ability to do proof of concept. Uh, you guys are showcasing things. It's been a very much, a, it's been around for a long time and you guys continue to improve it. That's awesome. But these distribution and the staging centers that you guys have around the world as well, because when you talk about 20,000 locations, you're not making that number up. You guys have customers, you specialize in this. And that is is no mean logistical feat to get these things because there's multiple components that need to be staged and set up correctly because they're going to go to a location that probably doesn't have, uh, I don't want to say not the smartest people. They don't have IT people that are waiting to do some type of a configuration and setup. You need something that has been that, that all that's been thought through and it's easy to kind of turn and go. That's part of what you guys provide. The concept there is um, to create a factory like process. So in order to to get to these these, you know, tens of thousands of sites, um, it, uh, we would do all the procurement of the product, bring it into a central location and then um, get it tested, validated as much as possible. Maybe we've already experienced that in the Advanced Technology Center to, to help accelerate the process, build in any automation that is needed as well, um, and then get it deployed to site and as plug and play as, as possible for those types yeah. of solutions. Yeah, because that's... Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Kurt. I was just going to add in there too, is that those integration centers, you know, as we think about it from the edge computing perspective is that, you know, oftentimes all of our edge demonstrations and we do proof of concepts out of the advanced technology center. Well, that becomes a little difficult when you're working with people in EMEA or over in, you know, Asia region. And so we think about, you know, how can we truly show them edge computing if they're doing 300 plus milliseconds, you know, between St. Louis and their location. And so we've actually been expanding our edge capabilities from the ATC into those integration centers. So Singapore is the first one that we've got completed now. So if we have a customer over there um, specifically who wants to take a look at edge computing before they start investing into an edge in a box kit or beyond, they can actually use an edge server located right there, just the same way as we have one um, available with inside of Amsterdam as well, too. So we're, we're tying into those integration centers, not just for the warehousing and the rack and stack services, but actually, you know, trickling in the edge components to it as well too in order to you know really showcase what the power of edge computing really stands for when it, you think about that distributed model and all of that is actually being managed for the singapore and amsterdam sites through the st louis advanced technology center so we have a central management core system so where you can actually deploy it as a standalone system right thinking about those public sector customers stuff like that where they need to do the orchestration locally at that site you know just as a single example or the bandwidth is just too low you guys have your bases covered. Uh, and it, it's just the depth of the customers that you have and the complexity that you get faced with solving problems um, across multiple technologies. That's fascinating. Uh, as we're somewhat out of time here, what should we remember from this? What's most important? What would you like people to do next? Well, I mean, the biggest point is is to reach out, right? You know, okay. um, go to www.t.com. We actually have some articles that we've written up about our edge in a box solution. So you can go learn a little bit about it and some of the software vendors that we've already gone through onboarding process from. We have that we call them ISV spotlights. And so we posted articles about them so you can learn about the different technologies, whether it's computer vision, AR, VR solutions, whatever it might be. And, you know, our openness to actually go through and provide that onboarding services through our edge innovation studios is a big part, of that, right? So don't think that you are walking into edge computing with uh, unknown expectations, right? Or just not knowing because oftentimes yeah. we, yeah. they hear that buzzword, right? And then they go, 
we need edge, but we don't know what for, right? Let us help you find out what for. And that's the yeah. kind of the important process. And, you know, cause we do a lot of uh, proposals and they, they end up being like, well, what do you need? What are you trying to build, you know? And that really comes to, you know, leveraging our professional services teams, going through a design session with us or a workshop and being able to get educated on, you know, what is possible out at the edge versus what you would operate still with inside of your, your own data centers or just in a traditional public cloud sense. Yeah. Jennifer, any final comments? Yeah. So um, for, I, I think the, the key takeaway is if you, your customers or you're a partner or an organization, if you're having a, a challenge, um, some of the challenges that potentially we, we discussed here to, to think about, um, to think about edge and, and cloud as a potential solution. Um, and to almost, you know, check it out, give it a chance. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not as far in the future that, um, that, that some people are thinking it is today. Yeah. And the examples you guys are citing, uh, sound futuristic and, uh, but what also strikes me on these examples, when I think of that restaurant, for instance, is it some of the simplest things can be solved with not by adding complexity, but by just really, I mean, the thinking out of the box brings on whole new meanings in terms of what could possibly be considered to solve problems someone may be facing that they didn't even know that they should be considering. And I think that's one of the values with the fact that you guys stretch across so many vin so many disciplines that you are able to bring a completely different uh, set of potential issue potential answers. Um, not to mention the fact that you're you're doing this with other companies, so they benefit from the fact that you've probably seen similar uh, attempts done before. And so you can help people uh, accelerate that and not waste money in the process. Well, guys, I would thank you so much for joining us in Tech 37. Thank Thanks. you, appreciate it. Optimizing data latency can be critical, especially in healthcare, finance, manufacturing, industries where the flow of real-time data may be the difference between success and failure. Well, I encourage you to get your own copy of Cloud Priorities for 2023. WWT has a wealth of experts in this and all related areas. I encourage you to reach out and leverage the people, the process, and technology that they offer to help you succeed in the most efficient way possible. My name is Rob Boyd. I want to thank both Jennifer and Kurt for sharing their time. I also want to thank you for watching Tech 37. Yeah.